In the last couple of years, I have found myself on more than one occasion, sitting amongst a group of women, friends or strangers, other moms, mom groups, and the subject matter of sobriety and sober curiosity has come up a lot. This predates the pandemic, which I think is when a lot of people started reevaluating their relationship with alcohol. But what I found so incredible was how often it was not only women around me who were bringing up this conversation of this new curiosity as to what their own personal relationship with alcohol was, but also ways in which pop culture and society was presenting to women specifically what their relationship to alcohol should or could look like. This could be in the form of hashtag rosé all day. This could be in the form of a tea towel saying, is it five o'clock yet? This could also be in the form of a TikTok in which a mom could be showing you how to pour an entire bottle of wine in a to-go thermos and putting out the tea tag to make it look like you're just sipping tea. Yes, that is a real TikTok I've seen recently. You know, it makes you giggle, but it also makes you think about things. It makes you wonder, specifically women. Yes, we like to laugh at this whole like hashtag mom life, tired. Ooh, mommy needs a glass of grape juice at the end of a really long day. We're also of the generation in which we watch The Bachelor on Mondays with a glass of wine. ABC once marketed an entire block of television on Thursday nights. And the whole marketing process was all of their lead actors throwing glasses of wine at the screen, encouraging this to be a night in which you not only watch three hours of their television programming, but also consume red wine while you're doing so. It is very interesting to see the way in which advertisers are specifically presenting and targeting women with alcohol. These are some of the things we're going to talk about today with my guest, Sarah Levy. Sarah has recently written a book about her own journey into sobriety. She is the author of Drinking Games, which is a memoir in essay form from St. Martin. Her writing explores sobriety, relationships, culture, and identity, and has appeared in the New York Times, The Cut, Time, Glamour, Elle, Vogue, Refinery29, and Cosmopolitan, amongst many other publications. She currently lives in LA by way of New York City. And I was so moved by listening to her story, which is my favorite way to read a an autobiography, because you actually get to listen to the person tell their own story. I appreciate Sarah's willingness to share her story and to join us today. I think you will appreciate our conversation. Please enjoy my interview with Sarah Levy, author of Drinking Games. Um, well, I'm so excited to talk about your book, uh, Drinking Games. I think it's, it's interesting. I feel like finally, as a society, we are having a bigger discussion about sobriety and also the way that alcohol has been marketed to us as a whole and mm -hmm. not just like as a just as humans, but also like specifically women. And it was so wonderful to hear. I listened to your book and it was so wonderful to hear you speak on that because I feel like there's been all these like whispered talks for years I've had in like various groups specifically with mothers or other women who find themselves in their 30s, kind of just acknowledging and like questioning their relationship with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And you speak about it so beautifully in your book, and especially how often you started questioning your relationship with alcohol. Because to anyone else on the outside, you were living basically a real life rom-com. Like you lived in New York, you were a writer, <laughs> but you also had all these like really cool jobs, with these startup companies, you know, you had a, a fantastic flourishing social life. You, you know, were, had gone to college. You, you just done everything right. You, everything was checklist, like everything on the checklist you checked off, mm -hmm. but you still kept having, you know, these instances where you found yourself really looking at your life and specifically this one relationship that just kind of kept um, hindering you from experiences. And it wasn't with a person, it was with alcohol. Is what, you know, you talk about it in the book, but is there one, like what the inciting incident that made you go, I can't do this anymore and I have to take a break and potentially even break up with alcohol? What was that incident or what is one that sticks out 
really um, strongly in your mind. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Candace, for having me on and thanks for, for listening to my book. Yeah. I mean, like you said, this was truly a toxic relationship that was not serving me for many years before I finally made a break. But it was really deeply embedded in me to to drink and to think of myself as a drinker. You know, it was just it had become such a big part of my identity. I really just thought of myself as this fun, sophisticated New Yorker who needed alcohol to just like be the best, shiniest version of myself. And I think it was a lot of tiny moments that sort of added up over time, just waking up, feeling physically hungover, and then feeling a lot of shame about what I had done or said the night before. And just wondering, you know, does everyone feel this way after they drink? Like, do my friends feel this way? Is this just something that I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life? Like, is this just the relationship that I have with alcohol where I drink and then just kind of hate myself afterwards? It was just this like vicious cycle. And the last night I drank was not my worst. I write about in my book, you know, that I had woken up in hospitals. I had had fights with friends. Like there were some real consequences to my drinking that I started to experience like later in my twenties. And my last night drinking was like pretty unexceptional. I had gone out to dinner and drinks with my boss at the time. And I worked at a startup and he was pretty close to me in age. So his friends were all like around the same age. And I had booked a workout class for the next morning, which is like such a small thing, but I had paid for the workout class. And so mm-hmm. I, I was really planning on going. I wasn't planning on having a crazy night out. And those New York workout classes, they're not just like, oh, $10. It's like $35. No. <laughs> yes. Right. This was like a $35 Baseline. Pilates class or something. And I was like, I'm going. And so I really did not intend to have a crazy night out. I just remember drinking with everyone. And the next real memory that I have is waking up the next morning next to one of my boss's very good friends. And I didn't really remember what had happened between us and how the night had ended. And I just was so embarrassed and felt so disappointed in myself and just really sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. And for whatever reason, I just had this window where I was desperate enough to make a change. And that was, you know, that was the last night I drank. Um, The next day, I remember walking home and just thinking to myself, like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. How old were you? I had just turned 28 four days earlier. What was your first drink? My first drink, I was 15 or 16. I was in high school and I was like a pretty good kid. So that was like late for a lot of my friends. People had been like going to parties and experimenting earlier. And I think I was, I was just a perfectionist. I liked to be in control and I was kind of afraid of alcohol. But I remember when I drank for the first time, I loved it. Like I loved the effect produced by alcohol. I immediately felt just like I could relax. I could take a deep breath and I felt you know, confident. I felt prettier. I felt like I was able to talk to like the guy that I had a crush on and it had this magical quality for me. Um, like one of the first nights that I drank in high school, I like had my first kiss and it was romantic and sweet, you know, in retrospect, like we were both drunk. So it wasn't necessarily like probably as like picture perfect as I thought at the time, it was probably like a little awkward, but alcohol to me allowed me to have these like really amazing experiences. And I just like from the very beginning wanted more. Once I started to drink, I really had a hard time like stopping. I wanted the whole bottle or, you know, to be like as drunk as I possibly could be because I just wanted to hold on to that good feeling. It's almost like the way you wrote about the way you'd feel once you, because it wasn't just like a buzz. It wasn't Mm -hmm. just tipsy. It was in that like warm, drunk haze. But it's almost as if like 
when a superhero, like in reverse, like when a superhero puts on their cape and suddenly they're this like super person, it's like the second, the way you wrote about it is like the second way you would, um, like you would turn into this like superhero of a woman the second that you got into that fuzzy drunk place a little bit, the confidence, yes. like any blemishes you felt you had suddenly disappeared. All your jokes felt funnier, all your, like everything just felt, which I think so many people relate to, especially at that age, especially Especially when alcohol is in- introduced to anyone in a social setting that is, you know, I relate to feeling like a perfectionist a lot. I was around the same age when I had my first drink. It was four Coronas at a school party. I, I was 15. I like talked to the quarterback of the football team, except I did not make out with them. I did not kiss anyone. I instead was confident enough to make fun of him, which was not the move when you're trying to like impress the cute boy. Like to like all of a sudden I was a comedian and like <laughs> could like tell off Bobby Good in front of all of his cool football friends. So it did not turn out very well for me on that end. But but yeah, <laughs> when you get this like warm, fuzzy feeling of like I can do anything, I can be anything and I'm this confident person and you're, it's not you're loud, you're boisterous, you know? It's like everything mm-hmm. has that veil with it. And also we grew up with these high school. It's so interesting because you and I are around the same age Mm -hmm. and we grew up with like high school movies where that was like part of the plot. Right. Like a whole part of the plot of all these high school movies and all these shows on television was you would go to a party and you would drink and like that's where all the meat of the story would happen. Right. I remember watching the OC in like eighth grade or, you know, early high school and seeing like Marissa Cooper and like Summer and Ryan go to parties and drink and have these like fun storylines. And I didn't grow up in Orange County, California, and I didn't look like Marissa Cooper. I grew up in a sleepy suburban town in New Jersey and I had acne and braces until my sophomore year and an eating disorder and felt really uncomfortable in my, in my body. And exactly like you said, when I drank, it was like putting that like superhero cape on. I was transported out of myself, out of my brain and became this version of myself, you know, that I had sort of always fantasized about through like TV and and movies. And then college doesn't necessarily, no no one goes like, especially now college is different because so many young people, especially who've gone through the pandemic that are in the age of seeking out like what happens next. Mm -hmm. It's like they've seen, you know, that just because you go to college doesn't mean you actually go. So many people were still doing online classes that it's just, it's just changed everything. It's like anytime I try to have a conversation with anyone who's within the age range of, you know, late high school, early college years, their experiences are just so wildly different. You know, the glasses in which they used to see the world are a completely different prescription than the ones that I feel like we had at that point. Because the whole thing was you'd go to college, of course, maybe to like study, get a degree, but it was also like the party culture that came with it. Mm -hmm. It was so, that was just so embedded as just part of the experience. And I didn't go to college, but I had my own version of like a party culture. I was 16 living between the ages of 16 and 22. I lived in LA. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely went out and had a very fun, wild time. But I remember visiting friends of mine who were at college and just seeing like these, you know, the frat houses and the sticky floors and just like people weren't drinking because it was just fun and silly and giggly. It was like you're drinking to get drunk Mm -hmm. and just how far you can push those limits. Totally. And, you know, I remember visiting colleges and sort of evaluating all of it, the classroom experience, what the campus was like, and then going out to parties and getting a sense of like, what is the social life on this campus, right? Which is important and and valid, but it wasn't, am I going to find like-minded friends? It was what is the party scene? And I wasn't necessarily looking for a party school. You know, I wanted to go to a smaller college and wanted to study English and had like a certain idea of what that would look like. But when I got to college eventually, what I very much embodied was this idea that, you know, I needed to keep up academically in the classroom and kind of like 
go head to head with the guys in my like small seminars and be as smart as they were. And then also be able to keep up with them on the weekends when we partied, right? And I prided myself on my ability to kind of go from the classroom to the sticky frat house basement and take shots with them and stay up as late as them and stay out and go to the party after the after party. And it was positioned to me as, you know, this is all part of growing up. This is part of living independently. And this is part of like making mistakes, becoming, you know, a fully formed version of yourself. And I never stopped to think about the impact that alcohol was having like on my brain and personality during those really formative years. You know, I was constantly altering who I was and my sense of self and considered it to be this like really important part of developing and like becoming a young adult. And you mentioned that you had an eating disorder as well. You've ex- you've struggled with having eating disorders. Did that start in high school? That started for me right around middle school. So it was probably 12 or 13 and continued throughout high school and college. It's interesting to hear you say that you drank to relax and like essentially lose a bit of control. Mm -hmm. And so much of an eating disorder is about control. And so like the pendulum swing of those two things within a day or an experience, I can imagine is something that you've like looked back a lot on and even would find dizzying at that point in your life. And if you're calorie restricting, you know, and then only having alcohol on the other side of that, you know, you speak so often about blackouts and Mm -hmm. and also what you've learned about them since can you recall your first blackout so my first blackout was back in high school probably the second time that I drank so when I was around 16 I went to a party and saw the same guy that had been my first kiss a few months prior. And, you know, in high school, like everything changes so quickly, like you're hot and cold with someone that you like. And at that time we weren't like on good terms. And it was very much like an emotional reaction to seeing him. We like exchanged some words and he was like kind of crass in the way that like a teenage boy can be. I remember being very upset and remembering like, okay, alcohol makes me feel better. So I want to have as much of it as possible because I don't feel good right now. It was really a split second thought, but it was just this gut instinct to reach for alcohol in a moment where I didn't feel good and I didn't feel comfortable. And I had never like poured a shot or like a cocktail before. I didn't know anything about like how much alcohol to drink. And so I just poured a solo cup as if I was pouring it with water and I filled it with vodka and drank the whole thing and blacked out like pretty quickly afterwards. And I don't remember anything from that night. And what's scary about a blackout is your brain is not forming short-term memories. So with like brownouts or partial blackouts, maybe a memory can trigger the rest of the memories from that night. But with a total blackout, the memories don't exist to be accessed. So I literally have no memory of that night and uh, was brought home to my parents, which I don't remember, and uh, woke up in my in my bed the next morning. You know, that I think for a lot of people would have been scary enough to sort of alter the way that they thought about drinking. And I was disturbed by it. I remember being like really scared by the fact that I couldn't remember anything from the night. But what I learned later in talking to doctors and learning more about blackout drinking is because I blacked out pretty often when I was in high school and college, it altered my brain chemistry and blackout sort of became the default setting for me when I later drank, Um, which is just interesting to kind of think back, think back to. As you look back on so drinking in high school, drinking in college. Mm -hmm. And again, I actually think a lot of people who are listening right now, I would, I'm actually thinking more often than not people that are listening right the second are saying like, oh, I had an experience like that in high school and it didn't shake me either. And it's Mm -hmm. crazy to think that, you know, it could just be stepped over and be like, oh, well, that was a weird, that was weird, but it's fine. And then it is 
crazy that we as a generation just trudged forward. We're like, oh, nope, keep going. You just keep on partying. You keep on celebrating. You keep on having like toga nights or themed things. Yeah. And, and just And just get as drunk as possible as long as you're like, keeping up with school, if you have a job, you have a social life, then you're totally functioning and you're fine. And everything else is just is absolutely just fun and games. But then if it's you're just on this like, you know, merry go round, you think you're on a roller coaster. But when you realize it's just a merry go round and you just keep in that circle because suddenly you're not in college anymore and now you're an adult and now you're actually over 21 and then it becomes about this whole other version of drinking which is involved around like every single social activity that you do Mm -hmm. you know whether it's someone's birthday or something you're celebrating someone's job promotion or whether it's just brunch on a Sunday or whether it's just a pretty sunset or whether you're on a first date or a second date or it's Friday night and you got to go dancing because you're young and you have to seize your seize the day and seize life. And, and some people can walk through this. Like, do you remember being at a point, you know, as you were leaving college, seeing other friends who were enjoying their partying and enjoying things and it like wondering like, huh, maybe they're feeling the same way that I am or wondering maybe they're not. Maybe they're actually not feeling the way that I am. Totally. It is. It all happened so fast. You know, I went from being in high school and being told like drinking is bad. You shouldn't drink, you know, certainly don't drink and drive. And like there there was a lot of talk around like underage drinking to then getting to college and it just and being surrounded by really bright, ambitious people and everyone drinking heavily and it being just a really big part of the culture and how we celebrated and brunches, birthdays, midterms, whatever was happening, like we were drinking and that just carried me through college and then kind of spit me back out after graduation when I moved to New York City. And I did have these moments where, you know, I would just wonder if my friends were affected by alcohol in the same way that I was. So even like towards the end of college, I remember feeling really like empty and just feeling like, you know, I had been essentially on a bender for the last month of senior year. There was something every night of the week and parties. And um, I was sort of looking around and seeing that people had accepted job offers and people were going to graduate school, law school, medical school, whatever. And I was like, huh, like, when did we all do this? Like, I thought we were all just like partying and like enjoying the end of college. I didn't realize that like other people were kind of making plans And, you know, on some level, I knew that that's what I was supposed to do. And I had been kind of like applying for jobs, but I did feel really lost professionally and personally. I mean, I was 21, 22 and really wrapped up in like this college relationship. And all I really had room for was kind of partying and treading water. That was just really like how I felt. And I remember like feeling that I had missed the day in school where everyone learned how to party the way that I was. You know, everyone was going to all the same parties and participating in all the same like drinking events. And yet they were able to like wake up the next morning and go to the gym and like be at the library and kind of had their stuff together. And I wasn't sure, like I felt like there was something wrong with me. And there were these moments where I would think like, okay, I just, I need to get it together and sort of reel it in and figure out how to strike a balance between like working hard and playing hard, right? That was the narrative that I had always heard was like work hard, play hard. It was just really challenging for me to kind of toe the line between the two. And I also just felt like I didn't know when everyone else was finding the space and like the mental clarity to chart these grand plans for what they really wanted to do next. Like, I just was like, I don't understand how, how everyone's like nursing hangovers and like studying for the LSAT. Like when, when are we doing this? It just felt really hard. When were they doing it? I think the truth is not everyone was drinking as much as I was. So even if they were all at the same toga party or, late night at the bar, I do think there was a point in the night where people were switching to water and when they weren't necessarily like blacking out. And so when I would wake up the next morning deeply hungover and like truly unable to function, I think that a lot of my friends were also 
at 21, 22, you can kind of like bounce out of bed, even if you have had like, say they had had four drinks or whatever. I think they were able to sort of shake it off and process alcohol differently than I did. And so I think they were studying for the LSAT the next day when I was like sleeping. You make the decision to move to New York. It was initially a plan with you and a boyfriend that Mm -hmm. you had in college, but you Mm -hmm. ended up going on your own. Mm -hmm. And if I know anything about New York, (laughs) that is an easy city to drink in because you're walking everywhere. You're taking the subway. You're in cabs like Mm -hmm. that is people. You know, it's the city that never sleeps. And you can always find something fun to do in New York City. That is the magic thing to do in New York City. But I imagine that that you look back at first, thinking of that wonderful time, you know, getting there, being young, hungry, ready for like this next chapter in life, and how you could just so easily see yourself being swallowed up by, by those experiences. What was your plan of action when you were moving to New York? Yeah, so I graduated from college and my plan was to move to New York. And I remember telling my parents, you know, the end of senior year was hard. I have this breakup and I've been feeling really lost, but I am going to figure it out. I really, I want to, at the time, I knew I wanted to be a writer and I had been an English major and creative writing, taken all these creative writing classes, but I didn't know like, what story I wanted to tell. And I lacked the discipline that you need as a writer. You know, I wasn't sitting down and writing every day, but I had interned at certain magazines um, in college. And, you know, I told my parents, like, I I really want to be a writer and kind of like work in editorial. And my plan was that I would live in New York with roommates and find a job. Eventually I ended up pivoting to like working in social media and marketing as a lot of English majors do and was sort of able to exist and you know show up for work and act like everything was okay on the outside but very quickly was kind of like sucked into the pulse of New York City which to me was the nightlife and very quickly you know whereas in college bars closed at two o'clock in the morning and like you were in bed around three or whatever, at least you were like not out. It was very easy to stay out all night in, in New York. And, you know, I made new friends who wanted to go out the same way that I did. And it just became this cycle where I felt like I needed to keep up with, you know, more so than even in college, I felt like I really needed to keep up with my peers. And especially like as I continued to work in marketing, there were so many events, there were so many like networking events and things that were happening at bars. And I was drinking with coworkers and going to happy hours. And it really felt like, okay, I need to figure out how to drink and continue to have this be a really big part of my identity if I want to succeed professionally. And if I want to be able to keep up with people and, you know, form connections and get job opportunities. Like it felt like all of these conversations were happening when people were like out and getting to know each other that way. Which sounds so harmless. When you talk about Mm -hmm. it right now, it's like, okay, you drank in college. Okay, you drank in high school. You you blacked out. You know, a lot of people listening are probably going, yeah, I did that too. Oh, you, you had to drink whenever you were doing, you know, social events for new jobs. It all sounds so harmless. Mm-hmm. You even talk about your mother had cancer. She went through chemotherapy. Very, very scary time in your life. Yeah. However, when she was done with her chemo, you guys toasted drinks together. You know, it's like it was just there all the time. And all of these things make sense and sound totally for the most, you know, not to be like, it sounds like not a big deal, but a lot of people will justify it in their own brains because they probably had similar experience to everything that you're saying and be like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. We've all been hung over. But what I found really brave of you to share are the things that people usually don't share about, which is how often you were blacking out. The fact that you like the state in which you would wake up whether even if it was just in your own safe place or whether it was a stranger's place or you don't remember getting there. And also the fact that you were, you, you found yourself waking up in a hospital, not once, but twice. 
in mm-hmm. very, very scary circumstances. Mm-hmm. And that alcohol didn't necessarily then become a friend that was now partying with you. It was someone, it was a thing in your life that was starting to wedge space between you and your loved ones. I mean, the fact that there was a secondary hospitalization. I mean, when you think back on being hospitalized and how neither of those were the kind of the inciting incidents to make you go, hey, maybe I should take a break. What was it that was making you say, it's okay, I can power through this. I can have another drink. I had this idea in my mind, this stereotypical picture of what it looked like to have a problem with alcohol. And it was a very specific image. It was someone much older, someone who drank every single day, who drank alone, who, you know, woke up and reached for a bottle of vodka that was like on their nightstand. Um, Someone who couldn't function, who didn't have a job, who didn't have friends, who wasn't dating, who wasn't going to workout classes. And I just didn't fit that image. And so it rarely entered my mind that I could have like an actual problem with drinking that would qualify me for sobriety. And so for the, you know, seven years that I was like living in New York City and drinking before I inevitably got sober, I was desperate to just like find a way to make it work. And when I woke up in the hospital the first time, I had fallen out of a a cab. It was not moving. It had had come to a stop and I had just tumbled out of the, the door and fallen and hurt my arm. And it was scary waking up in the emergency room the next day and not remembering what happened and, you know, with stitches in my arm and, but it was an accident, right? It was like, I was able to... Anyone can fall. Anyone yeah. can fall. Like right? I, Anyone was, can fall out of a cab. Heels, sure. you know, night, it's busy. Yeah, it was my birthday. I, of course, was overserved. It was my 24th birthday. I'd had many tequila shots, like, and um, could have happened to anyone. Now, the interesting point is that I didn't tell anyone that it happened. I had one friend who was with me when it happened who... Um, took me to the hospital. But other than that, I didn't tell anyone. And so that is something that in retrospect was a red flag that like, I clearly knew that something was not right and like felt a degree of shame over it. Like I wasn't laughing it off and telling everyone like, oh, it was an accident and it happened. I knew that I had been really drunk and that was why I fell. The second time I woke up in the hospital was a Sunday evening after like a very lengthy boozy brunch with friends and blacked out and don't even remember how or why I was was brought to the hospital. I think that my friend and I were both really drunk. And I remember someone telling me that like I had gotten on his shoulders and we fell down a flight of stairs and like the, someone who worked at the bar called um, 911. But that time I just woke up in the emergency room and I think they had done like an EKG and the, I remember doctors or like note when I was um, discharged was don't drink so much. And that time really freaked me out because there was no like injury. There was no accident. I was purely like brought in because I had been so drunk. And I think ultimately like it's so easy to get lost in a city like New York. You know, I do, I remember leaving the hospital the morning after like the first time I had been brought there and just sort of like disappearing into the sea of people and just thinking to myself, like, no one ever has to know. I don't ever have to tell anyone. Um, I can, I still look normal. I can figure this out. I can try to find a way to make this work, you know, to, to stick to the story that I'm telling myself, which is the one that like, we're talking about on paper. Sure, I drink a little too much in college. I have had these like messy nights. I don't totally feel like I have a purpose, but alcohol is not the problem. Like I'm the problem and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to find a better therapist. I'm going to do a juice cleanse. Like I'm going to get it all figured out. And um, it just didn't occur to me until later that alcohol was the common denominator. Did you have friends at the time telling you, like, you got to stop? Like, did people go, you know, 
because often there's usually if there's a big group and if like it's a group that likes to go out and be socially gathering around alcohol, you know, everyone has known one person in their life that is usually the person that drinks too much at the table. It's like, oh, got to keep eyes on this one. You got it. Like everyone knows who they have to babysit. There's always that one person that needs to be babysat. Were you that person? Were your friends like, oh, God, she's just, Sarah's always the one getting way too drunk? Or do, do you feel like they had no idea? Yeah, I think I was the friend being babysat. I definitely had different friends who had to bring me home, who had to help me when I was too drunk to like get an Uber. I had one night where like I tripped in heels and like hit my face on the curb and friends were with me and like put me in a cab home. So they were aware that like I would get very drunk. I only ever had one friend, the friend who took me to the emergency room that night that I hurt my arm directly say to me, like, your drinking is scary to me and it's hard for me to be around you when you drink. None of my f- other friends ever said anything to me about my drinking. And, you know, we've had conversations about it since I've gotten sober where, you know, I think a lot of them just didn't know that it was possible for like one of us, someone like young and normal looking, right, to to have like a drinking problem. Functioning, think- successful, like have their life together, you know, on paper and on social media. Exactly. We didn't have like conversations about sobriety. We didn't know that you could be young and need to stop drinking or like have a a problem with alcohol. And I think, again, you know, we maybe had these ideas of someone who was like addicted to pills or drank daily. And like, that would be someone who had a problem, but um, it couldn't be someone who just like liked to have fun and go to parties and got a little bit sloppy. So Yes, I was definitely the friend that was being babysat. But as far as I know, it was never a discussion like of do we need to have an intervention or like, is Sarah okay? I think that they just thought like, she likes to have fun and she likes to drink a lot and she'll figure it out. Were you reminded at all of when you were struggling, uh, when it, moments in your life when you were very much struggling with your eating disorder? Did you feel like that's you know, there's so much secret and control and and shame that comes with eating disorders generally from what I've read about them and heard people talk about them. Did Did you kind of see that mirroring with your drinking at that point? Absolutely. I think I, from a young age, learned how to keep secrets from the people that were closest to me. You know, even my eating disorder, it started in middle school and continued in high school. And I was very careful with what I let people see, you know, like my mom would pack me a lunch and I would bring it to school and wouldn't eat it. And she didn't know, you know, and um, I would make sure that like, if I had a family dinner, I would eat just enough that no one would notice that I wasn't eating. Um, I was great at coming up with excuses for, you know, why I wasn't eating at like birthday dinners or like I always had, I had just had a big meal or I wasn't hungry or right. Like we, we become very skilled at telling people what they need to hear, sort of like get off our backs. And that control very much like made me feel safe and um, made me feel like I was okay, you know, when I very, when I felt out of control in other ways. And it was similar with my drinking, you know, even on nights where I would drink too much, like I would not go out with those friends for a little while. I would take a break from going out with those people and, you know, go out with another group of friends um, so that it wasn't like week after week, the same friends were seeing me get really drunk or um, even like I would lie to myself, you know, I, I would just tell myself that I hadn't had a big dinner and that's why I got so drunk or um, maybe someone had put something in my drink. Like I really believed these stories that I told myself and. Um, And I told them to the people that were closest to me also. I'm very interested for you to talk about when you did start going to meetings and going to AA, but I had never heard of a moderation management meeting. And I think it's important. (laughs) Like it was really important for you to write about it, especially given its origins and who started it. And, And just, I felt like 
the way in which you talked about starting to even tiptoe into meetings is I'm sure something that many people who have experienced, you know, their early steps into sobriety when they are essentially functioning socially, you know, how like the part of it is like how scary it is and, and admitting to your, you know, the first step is admitting that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, but then also when you're going into these rooms, you're not just admitting it to yourself, you're admitting it to a whole room of people. And I imagine that is a very, very terrifying thing, especially that first time. Um, so can you share with the listeners a little bit just for their own education about, you know, what you learned from tiptoeing into starting a group and meeting with other people in your sobriety journey? Moderation management is an alternative to abstinence-based recovery programs like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, It is designed to help participants moderate their drinking and in a group setting, come up with like plans and um, guidelines around their drinking so that they can like drink safely. Spoiler alert, like moderation is impossible for me. It didn't work. I tried really, really hard because that sounded great. Like, oh, okay, there's a way in which I can drink safely, but like continue to participate and like have wine at dinner with my friends. Like, great, sign me up. And I went to moderation management for the first time after um, one of my hospital visits, like the second time that I woke up in the emergency room, I was freaked out enough to, to think like, okay, something needs to change. Um, like getting sober felt dramatic, like waking up in the hospital is dramatic, but like getting sober felt too dramatic. And so I thought that moderation would be like a nice in between. And, um, I went to a few of those meetings and would share about like my struggles to, drink a normal amount and moderate my alcohol consumption. And I would leave the meetings with like a plan, like, okay, I'm only going to have three drinks this weekend and I'm going to switch to water at a certain point in the night, or I'm only going to have beer. I'm not going to have tequila. Like it was sort of always changing. And I was rarely It sounds like Weight Watchers, but with alcohol, but like you're not just in your clear mind thinking about like (laughs) what you're going to be putting into your body. You're like, chemically imbalanced, like changing, you're altering the way your mind thinks before you're deciding how much you're going to put into your body, which is a whole different thing. Right. It's so true. And it's like anyone who's ever dieted or been told like you can't have something probably can relate to the phenomenon of them wanting it more than ever. And so once I told myself like you can't have tequila shots, but I started drinking wine, like all I'm thinking about is I want tequila or whatever the the forbidden drink was. So I tried to moderate for a while and it was just really frustrating because it rarely worked. There were some nights where I would sort of roughly stick to my plan. Maybe I would have four drinks instead of three, but I was miserable on those nights. Like I was hyper fixated on what everyone around me was drinking, how much time had passed since I had ordered my last drink. It just wasn't fun. So I stopped, I stopped doing it. I stopped even like really attempting it, but it was like my first brush with kind of a group of drinkers trying to figure out the drinking thing. Well, and also I thought it was really fascinating. The person who started this style of group Mm -hmm. would go on to get in a drunk driving accident and went to prison and then eventually continued drinking, correct, and then took their own life. Like this, it was, it's a very sad, sad story. I'm sure when you, you know, realized all of that, that was pretty (laughs) eye-opening. Did you research that for the book or did you learn about that while you were attending these meetings? I researched it for the book. I actually didn't know any of that until years later. My experience with that group was, I think there were a lot of like, suffering people who are going to those meetings, hoping for some relief and hoping for community. And it was painful at times to sit through some of those meetings and hear people like cry and share about how they had every intention of not like drinking, finishing the bottle and being able to show up for their spouse or their child. And like, once they started to drink, they were, they lost control and they were unable to, um, 
to moderate. And, you know, I think everyone has a different relationship with alcohol. In my experience, if you've gotten to the point where you need to attend a group to moderate your drinking, like you may have already crossed a line in which you've become dependent on alcohol in in some sense. And I think it's just very tricky. I think it's very unrealistic to start drinking and then be able to pull back or stop once you've entered that place with, you know, with your relationship to alcohol. That was my experience. I love the way you talked about um, the anticipation of going into an AA meeting and just who you thought was going to be there and just what you what you expected, which I think so many other people expect when they think of AA or what has been projected to them. And you Mm -hmm. found the complete opposite. Why was that the time you went to a meeting? Like what made that day different? And what did you walk away from that made you come back to an AA meeting? Fast forward a few years from when I was going to moderation management meetings, I was maybe 24 at the time. I then got sober when I was 28. And, um, you know, I just knew that I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it on my own, right? I woke up that morning next to my boss's friend and I was done and I just knew something had to change. Um, But I had spent the last few years trying really hard on my own to control my drinking. And so I had a lot of data points that showed me that it was not working my way. I didn't know anyone who was in recovery through meetings. I didn't have any reason to go really other than like complete and total desperation and like a desire to just live differently and not feel so empty um, and not feel so much shame every week. And I really thought that AA was going to be like moderation management, like kind of sad and frustrating and that it wouldn't provide any real relief or um, solution. And my experience was completely not that. I remember walking into a women's group and just being blown away by the amount of joy that I felt in that room. Like that these were young women who were laughing and they had like nice outfits and friends and some of them had engagement rings and some of them were pregnant. And I was like, wait, what? Like these girls have full lives and they don't drink. And, you know, they shared about career milestones and it wasn't just about alcohol and like whether or not they were going to drink it. They were living life sober. And, um, you know, I remember hearing people say like that they came for their drinking in the beginning and stayed for their thinking. And that really resonated with me because it was like, even at that point, going a couple of days without drinking, the thinking was overwhelming. You know, at that point I had become so addicted to like this crutch, you know, to this behavior that I turned to whenever I felt any degree of discomfort or when I wanted to celebrate when something good or bad was happening. Like I had been programmed like to reach for alcohol and... And numb it essentially. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And like the thoughts were unbearable, right? It was like, how am I never going to do this again. Like, how will I date? How will I fall in love? How am I going to be able to keep up at work? What will my boss think? What will my parents say? What will my friends think? Like, who am I if I'm not the fun person who drinks? Like, it was constant, like nonstop loop going on in my brain. And when I walked into that meeting, I just remember feeling a sense of like ease. And for that hour, at least, I had hope that things might get better and that, you know, if these women were okay, maybe I would be okay too. You know, that was just an extremely powerful experience for me, you know, for the first time in my life to see women who were sharing about having the same emotions and experiences that I had had. Like they, you know, had, they still had insecurities. They still had doubts. They still struggled with feeling inadequate at times, but they were, learning how to navigate those challenges without alcohol. And, you know, in that moment, I realized like, that is really what I, what I want. Um, Because I felt like if I didn't try at that point, I knew what the next like 20 plus years of my life would look like. And, you know, I did have goals and dreams. Like I had things that I wanted to accomplish and I wanted to be 
a version of myself that I liked, you know, someone who showed up for plans and wasn't canceling all the time because she was hungover. And I wanted to feel good. I wanted to enjoy my life. And I just was finally able to admit in that moment that my drinking, regardless of whether or not it fit the description that I had in my head of like someone who has a drinking problem, my drinking was impeding me from living the way that I wanted to live. And knowing you and knowing yourself, it sounds Mm -hmm. like. I mean, I think you at one point you were writing about, you know, a neighbor that you had had who was like an influencer and and just all the things that we feel like, you know, to what you were saying earlier, like, okay, if I if I do this workout class or maybe this cleanser, this is going to make me feel better. These pair of socks with these shoes or this, you know, cream for my face or this beauty treatment or this spa treatment or this, you know, anything on the outside, but so much of the work inside of just really getting to know yourself. And when that is numbed for so long or masked, it's it's a process, I'm sure, to actually be like, hello, hello, self, who are you? It's nice to meet you. How do I present in the world for all the things you just listed? Like, how do you date? Like, I imagine anyone who's maybe at the start of their own sober journey or sober curious that that is something that they probably are consumed with as well. Like, how do you go out and date or have sober sex or sober, you know, a sober wedding, you know, go to someone's wedding for the first time, um, you know, do all these kind of things that are traditionally you know, where alcohol is one of like the cornerstones of the event, you know, Mm -hmm. how do you even approach going to that? Um, What were probably some of the bigger struggles, like the things that you didn't realize would be more difficult in your early days of sobriety and the things that were surprisingly like almost enjoyable, if not approachable that you thought were going to be hard? In the beginning, it was like the tiniest most mundane events were hard. So like a Thursday night work happy hour, I wanted to jump out of my skin. Like I did not know how to talk to my coworkers. I didn't know how to stand there while they were all going to the bar for another round. Um, Like I just felt like, oh my God, I'm never going to have fun again. Um, I'm so uncomfortable. And, you know, the truth is, is like, the more I got to know myself and reconnected to like the younger version of myself and the authentic me that was buried inside, the more I realized like, oh, it's not that I'm never going to have fun again. It's that this isn't fun to me. Like, I don't enjoy these people. I actually don't. I'm not interested in these conversations. I'm uncomfortable because this isn't where I want to be. Um, and on the flip side of that, you know, things that I was really, really worried about, like going to a wedding sober, I was surprised at how joyful some of those like early sober weddings were. Like they were an opportunity for me to learn that like, I always thought that weddings were just about the guests enjoying the open bar and like having an excuse to party. And obviously weddings are not about that. They're about like, showing up and bearing witness to two people who you love choosing to spend the rest of their lives together. And, you know, like I actually came to really enjoy like wedding ceremonies and being present for those exchanging of vows and like dancing afterwards. Like I was surprised that I actually really liked dancing sober. And, you know, I think like the takeaways for me continue to just be that like this event is not all about me. If I'm not having fun, like I don't have to be the last person to leave. I have shown up. I have, you know, been a present participant in this night. Like I can go home at 930 and that's okay. In terms of dating, you know, I would say to anyone who is sober, newly sober, um, that you don't have to like jump in back into dating right away. I think for me, there was like a grieving period for my former self and for this like party girl persona that I had. And I really needed to like give myself time to step into this new version of who I was and then get to know her as cheesy as that sounds. Like I did need to date myself a little bit. I needed to like spend weekends on the couch reading and like watching TV and just figuring out like who I was and the type of partner that I wanted to end up with one day and spending time with friends and just like for so long and a common refrain throughout like the story of my drinking is 
I was interested in this guy or we made out or I was going out drinking because like I wanted to get over an ex or right. Men were really a big part of my drinking career. And I needed to take a little break from that and to then kind of come back when I did eventually like re-enter the dating pool. I think I had just a better relationship with myself, which I had always gone on dates wondering like, does this person like me? Is this going well? Am I going to hear from him? And in sobriety, I was sort of able to practice shifting the mentality from like, does he like me to do I like him? And Mm -hmm. do I want to hear from him again? And do I want to spend my time with him? Like now that I'm sober, I'm super aware of how I feel. And if I'm having a good time and if he's interesting to me or if he's asking questions and I just sort of started paying attention to that instead of being so hyper fixated on like, am I getting validation from this person? Right now, I feel like, especially coming off of 2020, I think so many people have had to reevaluate their relationship with alcohol because they were home and maybe drinking more than they had in a long time. And it's really interesting right now to see this rise in sober bars. Like there's bars where it's just compl- everything's non-alcoholic. You know, there's a lot of companies that are just, you know, non-alcoholic, you know, drinks. I, like it's not a liquor, but it's like to, you yeah. know, non-alcoholic gin or a non-alcoholic form of vodka. Um, there, you know, a lot of there's beer companies making zero alcohol beers. Um, so this is like something that a lot of people are obviously experiencing enough that when 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 alcohol companies are now catering to the non-alcoholic um, community uh, and the sober curious or sober community, it means that a lot of people are finally vocalizing that that's what they're needing. Are you encouraged by seeing that? Do you feel like, have you seen in the last couple of years, things have completely changed? Do you have a lot of friends who are now talking to you about sobriety or their sober curiosity now since the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. I actually just got back from my book tour and we visited a lot of sober bars and like non-alcoholic spirit shops and did some book events in those spaces. And I was blown away by the communities that exist in different cities that are comprised of sober curious people. I got sober in 2017. And then, you know, in 2020, like, everything shut down. And I feel like reemerging into the world and seeing all of these like sober and sober curious spaces is very encouraging, especially for, you know, young people who are just now sort of embarking on the journey that I went on. And, um, I do have friends and, you know, friends of friends who send me messages who are curious about sobriety and just trying to drink less. And I think when I was newly sober, the only non-alcoholic options were like club soda and like diet Coke. And I love a good sparkling water. Like that's still probably my go-to non-alcoholic beverage. But I think that it's just, you know, you feel less alone when these spaces exist and incur- are encouraging and these non-alcoholic beverages are, you know, encouraging you to imbibe less, right? I think it just lends itself to this larger movement around like conscious drinking and sober curiosity, which certainly didn't exist in my early 20s. And I do wonder often, like, if I would have gotten sober sooner, had there been spaces like this when I was younger. Coming off of your book press tour uh, for drinking games, what is, has someone shared something with you that's really stuck with you? Like a member in the audience? Um, Just because again, I think what is so wonderful about you sharing your story specifically is that there was not there was not like some giant rock rock bottom where you were suddenly had no place to live mm-hmm. you're like just you know you hadn't hit that point the only rock bottom you would hit is really your own personal life that you knew about like you were able to keep up you know appearances so wonderfully for a majority of the people in your life and i think that that is a a something that isn't always to have you found that a lot with maybe meetings or other people who are sober that you've gotten to know over the years that that actually is very very common because I think you know so many people expect that rock 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 bottom it's very common I have so many friends who were 
really high functioning who had big jobs and some some had marriages and you know I for me like could hardly get to a second date when I was drinking so to me like that was always really impressive when someone would get sober with like a relationship already but yes there's so many people who like on the outside were high functioning who were struggling with their drinking and you know I have had so many incredible conversations with people on my my book tour for drinking games and I've gotten a lot of very powerful messages. And I think like the most powerful ones are from really young women. Like I recently connected with someone who's 19 and is experiencing like a lot of the same blackouts and um, emotions that I experienced with alcohol. And she is scared to get sober at 19, you know, because she's very young and has so many things that she hasn't like experienced yet. And was sort of asking me like, are you allowed to get sober at such a young age? And I think just having conversations and knowing that like young women continue to be having these experiences is very, um, like validating because I often look back and think, was I just doing it wrong? Or like, could I have pivoted when I was younger and figured it out? Like, did I not try hard enough? And every time I meet someone who's young and either in college or fresh out of college and struggling with drinking, it really reminds me of how powerful alcohol is as a substance and how powerful, you know, even with like all the non-alcoholic beverages and like the sober curious movement the alcohol industry is still very powerful and we still are Mm -hmm. conditioned to think like you need to drink and you need to figure it out and um anytime I connect with a young woman who's like in that in-between place with alcohol it just really reminds me of how much I struggled even though now I can look back and sort of like intellectualize it and I've written about it and I talk about it like it was really hard at the time. Yeah, I'd imagine like even at night for this girl who you're talking about at 19, you know, you even mentioned thinking like, well, what if, well, what if when I get engaged one day, I want to celebrate with a glass of champagne. Will I be able to do that? And you're, you're married now and mm-hmm. you write very sweetly about getting engaged and how you guys celebrated your night and just how happy you were. And that was not like you weren't sitting there. I mean, I'll let you, it's your, it's your moment that you lived, obviously, but it was a, like you were so anxious, you know, before. And then when you found yourself in that moment, you felt so complete and so happy. I did, you know, that was one of those moments that I always had in the back of my mind. How will I get engaged sober? How will I get married sober? How will I celebrate and like experience authentic joy without champagne? And the truth is like, I was not experiencing any authentic joy when I was drinking because I was numbing myself, right? Good or bad emotions. I was numbing them. And when I, when my husband and I got engaged, you know, I was a hundred percent present for that moment. And I was surprised. I was excited. I was shocked. Like, and I think had I been drinking, you know, immediate well first of all had I been drinking I don't even think that we would have gotten engaged I don't even know that we would have like been in that in a relationship but um you know had I been drinking I think it would have been like let's celebrate like let's have drinks of of course and um instead like I was really able to just be present with myself for how excited I was to have like found my my partner and you know like my grandparents have since passed away and I was really close with both of them. And, you know, we were able to like FaceTime with them and like, I had conversations with both of them and how, you know, excited they were. And like, I remember those conversations and I know that had I been, even if I had had like a couple of drinks, like the whole day would have just been a little bit blurred around the edges. And same with my wedding day. Like I always wondered how I would survive a wedding without alcohol. And I actually don't know how people drink at their weddings. I mean, people don't drink the way that I drink. So I'm sure most people just like have a drink or two. But for me, like, there's no doubt in my mind that with the adrenaline of the day and probably not, like I didn't eat that much throughout the day just because you're so busy, you start makeup early. And then the pictures, by the time you get to the reception and you have your first drink, like I am sure that I would have blacked out at my wedding reception had I been drinking. And, 
instead, like I was dancing, I was present with like my friends, my family. I remember every second of it. And, and it went by really fast sober. So I feel like had I been drinking, it would have just gone by that much, that much quicker. It's just these like life moments that I'm able to be a present participant for. I'm able to really like show up for my life today in a way that I just couldn't and didn't have the capacity for when I was drinking. Well, I'm glad that you are also willing to show up to write this book. I think so many people are going to get a lot from it and um, find peace and comfort because you were willing to share in a lot of vulnerable moments that you experienced. So truly, congratulations. It, first you. of all, just writing a book is that's a huge accomplishment, which you know anyone I know in my life that have has ever written a book said it's just a very large labor of love. And so to, you know, it's like giving birth when it finally comes out. So congratulations. And Thank before you. I let you go, because I've taken up so much of your time, but I have five questions. It's just a little, uh, little, whatever. The first thing that comes to your mind, okay. you don't have to overthink it, but I'm just gonna ask you five simple questions to close this out. Can you tell me something that you like? I really like cheese. Love that. Love What's your favorite cheese? I love a brie and we named my dog Brie after, <laughs> after the cheese. <laughs> That's amazing. Something that you know. I know that drinking would only, even on my worst day, make things that much harder. Something that you hate. I hate liars. Uh, something that you love that's not your family. I love myself. That's a great one. No one's answered that. <laughs> um, and then a quirky little fact about you, besides that you have a dog named after your favorite cheese. A quirky fact about me is that I was a big musical theater nerd in high school and did a cappella in college. Really? Yes. <laughs> like pitch perfect style? Oh, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, that yeah. will be our next episode. It will just be all about your a cappella career um, yes. in college. Yes. But, Sarah, <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And again, congratulations. A Super Bloom podcast is hosted by me, Candace King, produced by Melissa D. Mons and Diamond Imprint Productions, edited by Diane Kang, post-production sound by Coco Lawrence, and advertising partnership with ACAST. <laughs>